talk to the legends of the creative and entertainment industries. Industries. We talk to those on the rise. On the rise. On the rise. Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen asks about the highs, the lows, and everything in between. This is Outcast Creative, and this is Industry Interviews. Hello, welcome to Industry Interview. I think it's number 57 since we started these in July of 2022. And as uh, with all of these in industry interviews, they're always about something or someone creative. Um, and what could be more creative than the world of comics, graphic novels and uh, such like? Today, we've got a very special guest who's been in that industry for no less than 30 years. Uh, but I've got uh, 30 years plus, I should say. I've got a, a, a co-host with me all the way from um, Texas who's in the midst of blowing his nose. But as soon as he's ready, I'm going to bring him in. There he is. Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Mr. Benzo? All right. Uh, my allergies. It's, it got all rainy last night, so I woke up all stuffy. Yeah, no, well, I understand. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, the comic in comic book industry has gone through quite a significant change, um, I would say, in the last 10 years, especially. With uh, Is it fair to say we could call it the rise of the independence? There's lots of comics uh, being made on uh, Kickstarter and places like that indiegogo uh, fund my comic yeah yeah crowdfunding oh, comics exactly and uh that's good because it, it it means that it's no longer monopolized by the the kind of the big three um as it also were. more money directly to the creators uh they start to own their own ips you know yeah well stuff. someone who can give us a very unique and i would say quite historical perspective is our guest uh this evening ben cullis has been working in the industry for absolutely ages he's worked with some of the biggest artists um in the business I'll, I'll let him list them for fear of me getting getting them wrong but uh, i mean it's a long it's a long list um so if you do have a question for my guest at any point uh just drop it in the chat uh don't forget to like and subscribe and all that kind of thing and of course we'll be sharing this uh stream on various other platforms uh tomorrow and throughout the week um, so without any further ado, let me bring in uh, the wonderful Ben Callis. Ben, thanks very much for giving up your time and uh, joining us on the Outcast Creative channel. This well, thank evening. you for such a generous uh, introduction. Well, you know, I'm an award-winning writer, so I do try. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm going to do before you give us a bit more of your background is, as I say to every guest when they first come in, I've got a series of quick-fire questions uh, that I like to ask. I'm going to tweak a couple of these slightly uh, towards the comic book um, milieu but um, yeah so this is just to get an idea of what your personal influences have been uh, with your own experience with media film television that kind of thing so what was the first film you ever remember probably as a young boy seeing on the big screen at the cinema Jaws oh what a fabulous choice uh, what was the last film you saw at the cinema June 2. <laughs> um, have you got a, a person, let's let's say a, a, a comic book artist who you greatly admire but haven't yet got to work with that you'd like to work with? Bill Senkovitz. Mm. What, what have they done? Remind me because I'm, I'm unfamiliar. A great New Mutants, um, uh, the, uh, the Assassin. Hang on, I've just forgotten the... the, the, the um, so Bill Sankovitz has basically has been a mainstay of American comics for 40 years. Mostly does co covers now. And yeah, he's got a very um, like gritty, grungy, painted style for his Scratchy. comic. Scratchy. Cool. Yeah. I had this uh, little I had this comic book um, collection of all these great like cover art pieces from him and Joe Jesco and Julie Bell. And dude, yeah, all right, well, let me let me shoot through the rest of these questions before we get into that. Um, what about a comic book writer? Uh, that you'd like to work with that you haven't yet? Well, I just worked with John Wagner, and that was my that was my my wish. That was my. Uh, you know. uh, we'll take that. We'll take that as your answer. Do you have <laughs> a uh, favorite movie or TV show uh, that you like to watch at least once a year? TV show. I kind of gotten into Band of Brothers. I like that 
Baltese yeah. thing. Uh, movie. The right stuff, actually. I like that very Ooh. much. I saw that at the cinema on a 70 mil print. Gotta love a bit of Sam Shepard, yeah. Yeah, it was a, yeah, he was he was phenomenal. I, Have you got a film or TV show that you would consider a guilty pleasure? I liked Barbie. <laughs> Same. Cool. That that uh, we'll Can take that answer. Why I liked it as well. <laughs> yeah, go for it. No, that's the joke. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, and in the last, let's say, since 1999, so I guess the last 23, 24 years, is there a television drama series that you've watched that you've got gone, not including Band of Brothers, that you've gone, God, that, that's standing, that, that's a benchmark, that was great? I don't know if uh, Stepenzo will have heard of this. Green Wing. No. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's kind comedy of comedy at its finest. British quirky comedy. Well, I do yeah, like Red good, Dwarf. Uh, Andrew and, uh... Lincoln's first uh, <laughs> TV show. Was oh, it? Okay. Was that before that's life? Um, um, that's life. Or... Oh, maybe. Oh, okay, maybe this actually. Life, this, this, this. I think life. it was after this life. life. Ninety six, and I think Green Wing's yeah. ninety nine. So hey, okay, might. Yeah, might have been his second. Might have been his yeah. second. Um, TV show. All right, that's my quick fire questions. Over with. Apart from this, what was the first comic or graphic novel you ever bought that uh, nothing to do with anything you were involved in? I actually bought. Well, there's given and there's bought. The first <laughs> one I bought was the British uh, slash comic, which got banned. Action. <laughs> Did action get banned? Issue thirty-seven was pulled and pulped. And when it came back six weeks later, it had none of the grit and the bloodthirsty nature that the first 36 uh, issues had had. It got it was discussed in the Houses of Parliament. The Guardian were against it. The, it was called, what was it, the Seven Halfpenny Horror or, or, or whatever. It was given a title of being a... So that was 1976. I was nine years old. Wow. What, what, why was that um, Why was that censored? It, it, I'm taking it... We're talking about this issue, are we? That's the one. What? What do you mean? Can, trying, commit, uh, telling people to commit suicide. I can't see that being a problem with uh, oh, nine-year-old. Why is that? Uh, is that what was in the? St oh, I see. It's on the. I just, I just saw it on the front. I'm like, okay, yeah, commit suicide. <laughs> three, <laughs> three ways to do it. Yeah, that's probably not the best. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. So well, there's clearly their um, reference to, to Rollerball, which is a great movie. And yeah. they did that. They did a hook jaw, the white shark with a with a, with a kind of a boat hook in its knees. And it was just obviously jaws and yeah. Six Billion Dollar Man was in it in, in one form or another and other bits and pieces. It was just British, British kind of take on American tropes. And it was great. You know, they, they had a float up bar in one of the hook jaw. I didn't know what a sit up bar in a, in a, in a, in a you know, the Caribbean was. I, I imagined that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I used to get Battle, which um, and then got combined with this comic. Bat Ooh. became Battle Action, didn't it? Um, so back in the day, but yeah, I don't think my parents would have been very happy if I'd had that issue. I get, I guess, I can see why that would have uh, been taken <laughs> off. It certainly wouldn't be published now. Um, so, how did it all start for you? How did you first get involved in comics? What was your segue in and your initial <laughs> role? I don't know if this is typical of people who do this sort of stuff, um, publishing as a whole. I was the editor of the school magazine, the school, the school newspaper. Where did you grow up? I grew up in South Devon, west of right, West Devon. Okay. Um, so, on the coast there, which is, so, think about Jaws. I mean, my mum <laughs> taking me to see Jaws, and I lived on the coast, and I was seven or eight years old when Jaws came out. Yeah. That gave me issues. Yeah, no like, one wanted to go in the sea. I remember like, people no, were afraid to go in the bathtub because of. Yeah, jars. they didn't. They didn't even want to go in the swimming pools. Like you know, was, I, I remember that. I remember the effect it had, and there was a lot of complaints from swimming yeah. pool owners and all of this kind yeah. of thing. So, so, so yeah, after school, school, after school, it was an after school club. Um, three or four of us were part of the editorial team. Um, I've got newspaper cuttings of me going and seeing the local editor of the local newspaper. Um, Someone sent them to me, you know, the wonder of the internet. I featured in a local newspaper as the school editor um, and then carried on through schools, through university. I did publishing um, and uh, worked for indies and did zines. I worked in punk zines and all sorts of things nice through time. the 80s and then uh, had some con had some contributions as submissions to some other British uh, comics and magazines. And um, 
yeah so uh, it was a kind of but it was always on the independent side i was i've never right. really been mainstream you know and always in the role of editor or okay so i trained uh, as a graphic designer and an animator uh went into film animation uh when we were doing you know hand painted cells and all that kind of stuff um, where, where did you where did you go for that i went to a new um a newcastle uh, polytechnic as it was then right uh, it was yeah a production course um yeah. second year of entry while the money was still very good in the late 80s they were very well funded courses it was a degree it was a sorry it was an honors degree so we did a practical element and had to obviously write a thesis as well right. um but we had to produce in two years major productions and then you had to go and either assist to direct or edit other people's productions as well so i got a smattering of doing all those things um I kind of went in being a bit of an artist and thinking I could draw and stuff and then came out and felt that there was always going to be people who were better than me and maybe I should just work with them. Right. Okay. So how did that, where did, where did you go from there after? after well, you... I don't know if you remember the early nineties, but um, I came out of college and uh, graduated in the middle of an almighty recession and yeah, I, I do struggled, remember that. For, struggled for years. And in fact, um, did that thing which a lot of people do is when you've got a family and such, you know, you've got to put you've got to put bread on the table. Um, I I converted my my um, qualification and 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 went into teaching. Uh, I taught graphic design, computer design, um, animation, um, and did that. I've just only come out of that in the last five years. So um, spent you know twenty five years teaching other people who went on and did great things in the industry as well um thoroughly enjoyed it and it, it, it paid really well um i'm very fortunate that five years ago i could um opt out and uh covid was the kind of defining moment for that yeah so um would it would it be fair to say then that, that in that journey up to that point you were rather unconsciously through the bits and pieces that you would you were doing making the necessary contacts bumping into these other artists and things along your way um, that would, would that would set up the bedrock for what would become 77 publications and the okay so that's a great question um yeah. it's interesting like myself and i think with other people sometimes you need to be in the right circumstances and the time isn't right with those circumstances and maybe your skill set and maybe i always knew i was looking for a team okay right and i've worked with various teams doing various things but this is the team that's really clicked for me so there's steve bull dave healy joe healy brendan um wright and um andy richmond and i've got two art editors in that and the rest of the other guys are writers and creators and we are the 77 publications okay now with the offset of social media mostly facebook so i joined facebook in 506 quite reasonably early on I set up some um, groups which were to do with comics of my youth and that I was interested in, and they've grown and they're kind of quite large in their field now. So the the the, the, the 2000 AD centered um, group is possibly the biggest one on Facebook uh, as a fan uh, group anyway. So obviously when you're discussing things with people week in, week out, producing, it's like producing a magazine, isn't it? You know, you produce, yeah. editorial, you produce content, you produce discussion things, you know, threads, message boards all that sort of stuff you get chatting to people and you start finding out who's great at doing logo design so for that that one there for example by steve green one of our guys um the pieces came together and we just kind of went you know in in stopford's artwork there for number six um that is a play on one of the other but not banned but one of the other um, action um covers which got them into hot water it's a shot of a child with a chain looking like they're beating on a police officer on the floor um i don't know if that was with with anybody but i spoke to ian about this particular so it's about this is this is extinction 2040 and you know we can talk about tropes we can talk about things because we've got a love for these comics as well so i've ended up in the last four years just in the last four years as this thing has really snowballed and being able to call on the resources and work really closely with about 60 people right. and and COVID meant we couldn't get together, but we did an awful lot of these shows that we're doing now. You know, we did introductory shows. We had weekly meetings, video calls, everything. And we all got to realize that actually we could trust and work with each other and really test ourselves in terms of, you know, our reliance and, and interdependence with each other. 
So Ian, for example, is a fine artist and he's never really done comic books. This is his first, this is his first foray into comics. This is, so the date on this one would be 21, August 21. So although that's coming up to two and a half years, three years ago now, he's not someone who's done an awful lot elsewhere. A couple of British titles have taken his work as well. So he still needs a lot of help with regards to framing his work, balancing a page, looking at panels, how you do a splash panel, those kind of emphasis, you know, mm. but his, his color work and his, 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 his hand of his, you know, detail and his um, vibrancy is just there to be seen. So it's been the case with all of us. We're, you mentioned at the beginning of the of the show, you risk listed off a reel of the um, comics that we now produce. So we have a horror title. This comic is haunted. Mm. We have the seventies trope comic, which is called Blazer. Um, Seventy seven, which is a science fiction fantasy anthology. So um, Spencer, if you think it's like um, Omni or uh, met heavy metal, it's kind of that kind of it's kind of that kind of. Cool. You know, it's oversized, so it's that standard magazine size, not 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 American comic book. No British, yeah, British paper. Yeah, British size over over, and you know, we run sometimes up to eighty pages or something like that. So not every every issue is eighty pages, and Blazer is that kind of old, um, what we used to call uh, bog roll. Okay, kind of point, you know that. Yeah. Kind of Really poor quality paper, i.e. the interior of all the old Marvels and DCs. So those papers there. So Steve McManus, uh, the guy riding the chopper bike on the cover there, he was an editor for Action and, sorry, uh, assistant editor for Action and was the editor for 2000 AD and what they consider it to be. It's like golden era. So he he commissioned an awful lot of amazing artists and writers who've gone on. So Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, Bisley, um, you know, the list is very, very long of these people who've gone on since. And he came to me um, and, 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 and we were chatting at a convention and wanted to do just something to remind him and other people of these old style comics where, you know, yeah. the, the welcome, you know, the welcome to the bullpen, isn't it? That kind of notion at the front and then comic -y pages of, and, 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 you know, just black and white is, is screaming at you there. It's the aged thing. Um, we even we even created a whole mythos about this. There's being a found comic saying that the uh, oh. shipment had gone missing in Singapore docks in 1974. So we boxed, <laughs> uh, we boxed the paper, we stuck a sticker on the cover saying the new price. Um, and it kind of, it took off. And again, this was just during the COVID cycle. So one of the, one of the lockdowns and we're very fortunate. So having got yourself a whole bunch of people and an idea and working with people and people keep coming forward ideas for strips and stuff, the, serendipity of the whole situation was that when we first broke and we did our first two three kickstarters nothing else was happening it right. was so quiet so although we didn't really have a marketing budget although we didn't really have much in the way of so this is haunted the horror, horror strip horror, horror comic so although we didn't have a lot in the way of kind of like industry voice and whatever it was so quiet that people were desperate for something to review desperate for something to feature in their podcasts or and 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 subsequently you know we've now got four titles so this is haunted i don't know if you've got i don't know if you um have it because on the strap line it doesn't mention joe healy's comic which is um pandora so that's very much in the um that's very much in the um style of misty which is like a supernatural comic uh, i have about 30 issues of misty in the shed sure. in a box absolutely um yeah. joe unfortunately bless her um one of our, what I say, one of our directors of the firm. We were at the a large convention up in the north of England um, in November, and unfortunately, she took a fall, and mm. she's actually off work. Uh, she broke her neck and was quite oh, severely God. injured. So we work. We obviously wish Joe, as we always do on these events, you know, um, hope she's getting well soon. Although, you know, I do speak to her on a weekly basis. Um, you know, sometimes you have to accept that things get in the way. When you're like an independent, we don't have a whole you know, uh, this bankrolling of, of a title, which means we have someone to step in and do it. We, you know, it requires an individual to do a comic. So I do the 77. Dave Healy does Haunted. Joe's sister does uh, Pandora. Here we go. Uh, mm. That's one of the variant type covers. And Steve Bull does the specials, which was Lifeboat. And yeah, you know, there we go. So the artist there, um, Anna Moritzova, she's doing um, Judge Dredd and other things in the British comics. She's um, certainly been a breakthrough artist for the last couple of years. There's a lovely picture of Joe. Oh. And we try and keep that whole kind of indie uh, feel. 
in that everyone gets a chance to design the comic the way they want. We have a branding with regards to our logo and the fact that it's a, a, a branded comic. But, you know, we're, um, we're happy to let people as such go with an idea themselves. We, we back ourselves. And then it goes on to Kickstarter, which you mentioned earlier. And because we started Kickstarters when people were, yeah, looking for entertainment, looking for something to buy and get involved in and have a bit of a community. And we had the social, we had the social media already. We had the Facebook groups. Yeah. We kind of built the whole ethos and Steve Ball, the guy I work with quite closely, he, he came across with this notion and it's a, it's a great marketing notion. And anyone who works in marketing appreciates it. You build your market first, then you give them the product. Mm. If you, because it's then guaranteed that that market will absorb the product. You just have to make sure it's a good product. So we've yeah. got a market. We've got a few, you know, got a few thousand people now who won't buy necessarily every title, but they'll pick and choose and come for this and then do a hardback or a graphic novel. And these are anthology comics. And so, so, you know, it's a bit for everybody. Right. Um, I love anthologies, you know, and, and so, yeah, there we go. Very different one here. An Irish kind of Gaelic tale of, of a banshee. Um, and you can see straight away, completely different emphasis. You settle into yeah. a different mood entirely. Um, and I just love that. The fact is that this is Gary Burley's artwork. Um, Gary has work exhibited and works for the, the Scottish museum up in Edinburgh, uh, as illustrator again, Hasn't really been doing an awful lot of comics that people have known, but he's got his own work. He did a great um, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I think Captain Nemo graphic novel. Um, and these are people who've come to us and and, and like what how we work and want to be trying their hand with us, really. Um, and others. So this is uh, Lola Bonata. She, sorry, I beg your pardon. This is Andy Richmond. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but we have a smattering of different creators and such like. And um we just we know that basically it will touch different people with different persuasions and different sensitivities. So I don't really have an awful lot to do with these other titles. You know, I publish them. I kick, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the Kickstarter going, but I'm not standing over these people saying, oh, it's got to be like this or, or like that. And I think that's the great thing. So we have different flavors of things. Sure. Always good. So, I mean, that sounds like quite a complicated job. Um, mm -hmm. Overseeing four different I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm to me a, a layman not working in this field. Um, if I was overseeing four different movies as a producer, mm. you know, and each one's got its own little machine, um, that's a lot of running around. But then I guess this is all electronic essentially, it's all online, online meetings, emails back and forth. You're not running back and forth to set, are you? So it's, it's so I tell you, um, one of the great things is with the titles that I run is that I've got an art editor, Brendan, who lives in New Zealand. It's we'll nice. have a chat from 8 p.m. till midnight, and then that's his daytime. <laughs> I go to bed, and I wake up, and the work's been done. Good. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you can work with things around the world, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and okay, that's the simplistic view of it. But yeah, we've just managed to get the, the, the ball rolling and it's, go, it's going now. And, 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 and we've, you know, a few adjustments have been made with regards to personnel. Some have come, some have gone. Um, but in essence, I'm saying the six, seven names that I mentioned earlier, including myself, we've been pretty tight now for four years. And before that, we built, that saying, these Facebook groups. So all in all, I think we've been working together since 2016, 2017 in one capacity or another. So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of nice, you know. So um awesome. So, so Pandora is um because a lot of a lot of your creative team come from that group of people from the that, that grew up in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So Pandora feels like a throwback to Mis to Misty. Which, which Misty was like Tales of the Unexpected, but for girls. Tales of the Unexpected meets the Twilight Zone. Oh, look, we've got rabbits with machine guns here. Fantastic. I approve oh, of that. Good. 
This is like no, this General is like Benito. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah, about a hundred. That, like, that looks like General General Wormwalk from um, Watership Down. Uh, now that was a scary movie I saw on my own in 1978. Yeah, I oh, think yeah. that theme track put a lot of people the wrong way, didn't it? You know, a bit of bright eyes, and then they watched this horrifying film. The thing that the thing that really threw you was when you went to see that film. The first three minutes of it were, were this really crude animation. Like not like the rest of the movie. It was like done by a different artist, and it was like the intro sequence. Is that the bunny about... bouncing across the field? Yeah, and it's talk... well, it's talking about Frith, and the Frith is the, the crudely drawn sun, and and it and it it's just talking about the pecking order of of the creatures that eat each other, and then eventually cuts into a a bunny, and it goes into the eye of the bunny, and then you pull out, and then you've got the the different type of artwork maybe but, it's if um, animals did animation kind of notion isn't it you know yeah it was and at the beginning me and my friend thought my god the whole movie is going to be like this this is this looks really terrible so we couldn't stop laughing but then of course yeah. it went into the the serious mode and yeah it's a pretty gory film it's like lots of blood and lots of my uh, uh friend's yeah. parents wouldn't let them go and so see joe it. is a joe is a bunny rabbit fan she has bunny rabbits okay um but you know she's not she's not soft in respects that is going to be all cutesy you know so um yeah we're very much waiting and looking for we've got other projects coming through pandora so um we have a we have a, a young lady protagonist um a cult detective called penny pentagram here she is sitting down reading the the comic book and right. and you see the reference there is that the wallywoods um from ec i think or from one of the 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 sort of 60s horror horror it was a, a cover for one of the i think ec <laughs> horror books so we kind of like swiping a bit we take a bit of liberty with that wasn't um, it like from astounding stories or one of those yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i think yeah. the thing is that a lot of our readers being younger wouldn't necessarily have the, have the exposure of some of this stuff no. um and we're just kind of like we're not we're not here just to riff it all and just say um yeah thanks nick that's a great suggestion we're always looking for cosplay opportunities um i don't i mean like i say i think it's all done we, we have this we have this um kind of strap line which is uh the 77 um a love a love letter to the comics that made us in that i think we do kind of like say um you know we're happy to reference in some respects but i'd hope that people would appreciate that everything's original new strips um, oh sure but it's, it's 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 you know should we wish to do a manga i guess we'll do manga but that's where you know the majority of most comic books are being written so this is the last issue this is uh, and um this is based upon um a syrian um ancient mesopotamian um myth uh, the myth of baal and uh, that is the goddess Anat. Um, so we kind of like, you know, we like Steve. Steve loves delving into ancients kind of tablets and 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 and, and, and scripture and such like. Um, I feel like he watched Hellraiser, did a bit of acid, and then went and painted. Yeah, those. yeah. It's the closest thing we've done that cover to the shiny boobies, if you know what I mean. That kind of uh -huh. thing. We don't generally do it. I'm afraid what we have here is we have a split variant, so we haven't got the cover. It should be a wraparound, so that's left panel, and the, um, the when you when you when you pull up, you'll see the right hand side of the right. of the cover. Um, I like I'm that. The, the, the digital copy I gave you there. This is Ian yeah. Stockford's artwork yeah. again. Nice. Um, so that would be yeah, unbranded. We do these variant covers where we don't put a lot of other sort of stuff on it. Really naked covers. I kind of like. I kind of like that. Um, but, is that you know, what they're called? Naked covers. I, that's what I've heard. It. That's what I've heard them called. Yeah, but well, we don't do, we don't do 25, 25 variants. You know, we do the one. Oh, that's it. yeah. The the that's the thing that uh, you know is killing comic book stores is all the predatory variant covers that Mar the big two will do Marvel and DC. Um, it's not. It's yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It's not. Cool. I get you, and I think Kickstarter is kind of cool insofar as you can test the water. And yeah. we did we did one with with three covers and that was as far as we were going to go you know so um we just it's a great way of communicating people directly as well because you know they've got opportunities to comment and to get in touch on our facebook groups about what they like and what they don't like um i'm not saying that we will sway everything according to you know one person's opinion but you do no. build up a general mood music about how people take it so it's like our live marketing in some respects um 
Yeah, and what I mean, we can do with this stuff is basically because we've now got, I think, with all of our titles, we've got about, I think it's about fourteen hundred pages of strips. Um, mm. If we secure the rights, I think we've got the secured rights on about six hundred pages. Not everybody wants to be reprinted without, you know, something else happening for them. Um, if they didn't continue with us, or they want to use pull their strip back because it's, you know, the creators still maintain their their rights here. We, but because we work with teams and the writer is one of the directors and we then have a deal with the artist, we know we're going to go forward with strips. So for example, when you scroll up, you'll see V is the next strip. So that's been in every issue. There's 10 issues now, five, six pages in each. We can now turn that into a graphic novel of some type, you know, with background cool. work and what have you. So our, in, our introduction pages in the comics kind of work as a bit of a call to say, this is what's happening this season. You know, um, we've got a comic convention here. Lawless comic convention is something we get involved in, a British uh, comic convention, which is going to be happening in May. And then, as I say, V comes. And, you know, that's been in every issue now. So um, we can pull that, extend it, produce, uh, I guess the French term is you know the, the the graphic novel of a certain size certain thickness right. and we're just at that point now where we can start doing that so it's taken us four years to get the material we need and now we can go ahead and we can reproduce and um start playing around with it a bit so uh, that's 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 where we're at now walking into a comic shop in like france or belgium is a mind-blowing experience because there's so much stuff that content that you've never seen characters that you've never seen familiar looking artists that you feel like you've seen a bit of their work but then there's all this other produced stuff that's only available in in mainland europe it, it doesn't go to britain or america and it's 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 got a very european feel and those kinds of stories it's quite mind-blowing um w when you you see all of that extra stuff that you've never seen before uh, so i've got questions so you touched upon the rights thing there like um so the story story creators, they retain the rights to their characters and such. So let's say, for example, um, uh, you had a character here called Sergeant Shouty of the Moon Force, which just sounds mm -hmm. like a brilliant mm -hmm. name everyone should have. But so let's say Bob Smith comes to you with Sergeant Shouty of the Moon Force, and um, he's the uh, writer of the story and maybe he does the art or maybe he's got an artist who he, he always works with, but let's say that's the team. Um, he's got a story, 10 issues. First of all, just to get to the stage where yes, you want the story. What does he send you? Does he send you like a kind of a treatment outline in writing and then maybe some frames and some images to start? start you want me to discuss how people did get their work into the comic that's one thing if you want to ask about how we are looking at taking on submissions which which, which, which angle would you like me to sort of take? yeah let, let's maybe go with the second one which i think would be good for aspiring artists to, okay to okay know. Say somebody comes to you with something and you like it what, what typically do you want to see your gut feeling is you think it's good but what, what do you typically want to see and how does it go forward from there okay so that's a very interesting point. And basically, we have accepted, as I've said, we've taken 60 different creators work on board through the four mm. titles we've done. That can be pairs, you know, with an artist and a writer. Um, first essence is they have to understand that if we are going to take it, then we are all going to be sharing in how the money is split from a Kickstarter. So there's a minimum page rate that's offered. I generally find that if someone comes in and the first question they ask is, what's the page rate? It's not always the most productive way to start a conversation. So I'd say to somebody, you know, maybe hold back from that to the second meeting, you know, mm. try and get the commissioning editor's yeah. uh, approval first and okay. And it's always ideas led. So look, we if you want to do interior sequence, uh, sequential art, then give us some interior sequential art. Don't give us cover work. Don't give us single, you know, single sketch or, or should I say completed uh, design work of a character. I'm not necessarily going to be looking for that. I want to see how your work breathes and how it moves and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of in terms of how much you want to do, well, we would say um, how much is sustainable. 
I don't like the idea of starting off and saying to someone, sure, you know, those 10 issues you want to produce. If I signed you up and got you to do that, what happens if after issue two, three, life gets in the way or you get a better deal elsewhere? So it's it's a tricky one, I must admit. So um, we don't have contracts which pay pay out forward and 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 are, and are binding. You know, we we have agreements, and there's a, a notion that it's the French it's the French um, I think it's called the French model. So Pat Mills uh, uses this notion where the creators who start the strip will always get payment continuing and going forward. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, an artist dropped out and we got another artist in, the artist coming in also needs to appreciate that the artist who created the character is still going to get some payment. Yeah. And and it's coming from somewhere. It's not coming from outside the pot. Um, right. And I think that means that people have a surety about the value of their IP because otherwise – What's to stop someone, as you would imagine, you know, just saying, fine, you're fired. We've got someone else in. It's like, hang on, that that, that person created that that character. That Yeah, yeah well, that, that happens in, um, in the film industry with scripts all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, we're, you know, we haven't had as yet Netflix or whoever come and brandish the golden checkbook, you know? to say hell we love that strip we, we we're going to be paying development fees of a million dollars to do this and do that if if it did i guess money is the route to all evil you know and maybe our highfalutin kind of moral stance which i think genuinely is is heartfelt would be tested but we honestly have tested ourselves saying we the five six seven of us have worked together so long now that i feel that we trust each other and people can see that we've stuck out with certain stories and stuff uh, and, and, and kept them going. And if people want to know what happens if something isn't as, you know, if the working relationship isn't so good, you just got to ask yourself, is that person still working with you? Um, Cause at the end of the day, I think, you know, you lift people up that you work with and, and I think the most valuable resource in, in most creative industries are the people you work with. And when mm -hmm. you find people you can work with and you can trust, you need to evaluate very, very carefully whether it's, it's, is it, is the deal really that worth that much that you won't be working with these people anymore? And I just think that we're, we're solid and, you know, we didn't need a former, we, so we, so Enzo, we have an, uh, an LLP, we have a, a, a limited company, right? right. Uh, for the publications. That's just simply because I don't want to lose my house, you know? I don't know. Something could happen. I could, I don't know. We could put on a show and someone electrocute themselves of our stand. Do you know what I mean? And we could be mm. sued. So at the end of the day, we don't want that sort of stuff. I don't think, I don't necessarily think when you're only playing with thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars that you're going to lose your house over that. But if the big money was to come our way, I think we need to be solid about what it is. The structure is how we're formed and what have you. And um, basically most of the people we hire are freelancers, you know, yeah. not many of them are in house. Um, it's a, it's a tough gig, isn't it? But we get a lot of, we get a lot of submissions. So coming back to the question, you want to contact the 77 for the submission. This is the email, the 77 submissions at gmail.com. Okay. So, and if anybody wants to submit something, if you want to do interiors, please show us your interior work. Don't show us, yeah. you know, Crazy stuff. It's... Could you just give me that email address again, please? Yeah, T H E the seventy seven. So T H E seven seven. Submissions. Submissions at gmail dot com. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. Thanks very much. Um. So I mean, w once, once it you know somebody submits, you like it. Uh, you have a first meeting, you have a have a second meeting. Um, that strip is then added to the suitable comic within your range. So if it's sci-fi, yeah. female-centric, it might go in yeah. Pandora. Yeah. Or, you know, if it's um, old school, World War II, 70s, you know, dirty you dozen it. kind Absolutely. of thing, you put, you put it in Blazer. Um and and in terms of their payment, how that would work, I'm guessing is you'd crowdfund for that particular issue, and their fee would come out of the budget for that particular issue. 
you got it. Um, I mean, basically, it's as close as you can get to front end in that, you know, before the comics printed, we know what all the costs are. Kickstarter only hold funds for a matter of two weeks. It goes into an account after that. For us, we've got our shipment fees, production fees, printing, and then we we you know we'll take a very small percentage for managing the Kickstarter, and then everything else is shared out. And it works for us. Um, it's not industry rate, but the point is, as I've said, people have brought their stuff to us and then taken it elsewhere. And you know. Mm. The reason they can take it elsewhere is because guess what it's been printed and people have seen it so there are other we've been involved with an american um publisher that doesn't quite do the same deal um insofar as and no no problems at all and you know we were happy so we went with antarctic press and oh yeah ben and joe gunn so we've had their we've had five issues of our stuff put there um but that was on the pure understanding, and we knew that, that it was purely that whole kind of, you are now published in the States, you can say as much, but unless we print more than a certain X thousand copies of, of the comic, um, there really isn't a, a royalty rate as such. And that's fine. That was great for us when we were establishing, and it suits a few people when they're starting. We're just, I'm not saying we're a level above that, but we do sell in the same quantity, but only not in the States at the moment, although we do have a diamond deal. Um, basically, we're saying, you know, if you were to do, I'll just give you a, for example, if you were to produce five pages of colored art and did the line work and let's say you did the speech bubbles as well. Yeah. You do the lettering as well. Um, it's very likely that you'd be getting, you know, you'd be lucky if you got a hundred dollars, but it, 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 it's around that kind of, around that kind of figure, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's pitiful in, insofar as, you know, you're not going to pay your bills with it, but if you literally are, um, looking to have a go or get your foot in the door, yeah. door reestablish yourself to, you know, because a lot of our people are, re are returners, you know, a bit like me, they've kind of been through, done other things, had experience, been working in roundabout fields. And we just want to see if it's, if it's for them, you know, they love the medium, maybe they're still fans, maybe they, you know, whatever. Um, it's a good testing grad and, and, and you get paid something for it. So, you know, so this guy here, Rupert, uh, Rupert Lewis Jones, He's a game developer, um, so like a lot of the people here, they've got other, other, uh, other industry sort of, you know, uh, they work in. So yeah, he works, and I, I've got a whole list of the things that he's done. The new game has been out, most mostly role playing games and stuff. We got people saying who who are fine artists. We got people who do um, other 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 animation, um, all sorts. So it's, and we have some people who are purely comic professionals as well. So you said Sergeant Shouty, that's Lou Stringer. Lou started off working with Marvel UK in the in the eighties, did funnies, uh, short funnies and such, and then has worked yeah. with Viz and Beano, and Viz. you know, yeah, yeah, with Viz did the Pathetic Sharks. I've got a great Pathetic Shark. Oh, uh, good, yeah. <laughs> Buster yeah. Gonad and his uh, his uh, amazingly large, his amazing, great name. Amazingly large testicles. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, Enzo, do you get this British thing? This huge, this yeah. Guy? Of yeah. course, and I do love British uh, comedy and British uh, television, and I, I definitely know 2000 AD and that British style. But uh, cool. I know uh, Nix was asking in because he's in Transylvania. But like, you offer digital comics at all? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely, Nix. That's a great one, and we've got some great bundles available. So on the strip, on the um, on the strap line there, we've got um, the 77 comic. A big uh, big cartel so that's great you go there you'll find all our digital material as well if you are a kickstarter fan um our kickstarter which is running currently at the moment for if you just put in the 77 in the kickstarter, already there it's um it's in the information on the stream down below absolutely so you'll see that we're well. doing special special deals there as well and and digital so cool because i don't know i mean i'm trying to i I think British to US postage is a heck of a lot better oh, deal than US to 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 totally. To Europe. You, dude, US people get yeah. That's the thing a lot of these uh, comics gators are do, dealing with because you have to. There's a it's a it's a double edged sword because it's like if you want only hard copy comics because digital comics opens the door to um, you know piracy and stuff getting online. Obviously, I get you but, absolutely. Yeah, but. Uh, if you only want to do uh prints, like I was telling Nick's, like people in Australia, if you're in Australia, 
it's like you have to start like limiting like minimums on how much you order because otherwise it doesn't even become worth it to ship because it's like if for just a little floppy it's like 20 bucks to ship it there and it is yeah it's slightly a better deal the reverse way so yeah. from the uk because we have a nationalized postal industry i think actually i beg your pardon the state's interior your 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 yeah. your um surface mail is 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 a is a, is a us right. run postal right, service right. isn't it but everything else across the seas is not um so i could give you some quotes i could say for example yeah a uk what would cost uk 5 pounds to ship us would be 15 and that's yeah. and that's not dollars that's sterling so and that's the kind of stuff that turns off uh, backers you know cuz like you you put up your book and it's like okay $7 $10 15 20 dollars whatever and then you go to checkout and it, the price like practically doubles or know. you know triples know. you're like oh my god and i get it and also you know i'm looking at i'm looking behind i'm looking behind lance i'm looking at your 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 room as well you can't see my stack you get to a certain age can you continue to find the space to stack all your comics. You're I have boxes. another, I have a book. Mine, right mine are all here. in the shed like, in the garden. There. They're all in big <laughs> plastic boxes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, also, I also have a real huge bookshelf inside the house. That's got all the, yeah. um, you I've know, got many here. I will back, I will back a whole load of Kickstarters because there's that notion that I'm working alongside people. I know how valuable support is and just helping a little bit out. Yeah. And yeah. I oh, go yeah. for digitals a lot. I go fantastic yeah. book, fantastic book, and these things, right? Or is that the sorry? Is that the book or is that the model? The oh, that's uh, the book. Well, Strontium Dog. Uh, that's the latest uh, comic I bought. Um, yeah, because I'm a massive yeah. Strontium Dog fan. Yeah, um, but I will say I probably buy five times more digital than I do now, um, just simply because I, I've got, I've, I've, I've sort, I've bought and sold collections two or three times over, and yeah. You know, I don't I mean, want to get is, like, are you you know that, you know that yeah. Danish is that Danish thing, death cleaning. You know what I'm talking about? No. You know, you get to you get to a certain age and you start thinking, do I really want everybody to have to pick up the pieces after I I, I scuttle off, you know, oh, into right. the, yeah. the, so much junk, yeah. Dude. This wall yeah. of DVDs and VHS behind me, that's like a fraction of what I had when I lived in my house in Austin. I had three closets full of hard yeah. media. And after a while, it's like, man, I just get rid of most of this stuff. You know, it's all. And owning a digital is not the same as streaming because you own, you, you, you grab the PDF, you know, keep it right, safe. Right. Download it on your computer. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, people say to me, oh, but digital is not secure. You know, I've got a streaming service and they pull such and such. I said, yeah, yeah but if you downloaded it, if you could. It wouldn't be the same at all. You'd have it, you know, like, I mean, See, I love DVDs. Don't get me wrong. But now I've got the big television. Don't you find that the old DVDs don't look quite as good as you? Oh, no. And also the other thing I'm yeah. realizing is um, I didn't know this, but DVDs, um, like 20-year-old DVDs, they, they suffer this DVD rot. And they start literally losing pixel. They start getting pixelated and, and, oh, right. and very staticky looking. So even if this DVD is like in pristine K uh, condition, and it's not scratched or anything like you'll still get playback errors. It's like, wow. Yeah. So that's that was another big part of like why I got rid of it. So we're very DVDs. late in the UK to this whole notion of trading um, standard uh, quality. So grading. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I don't know. I mean, it's a thing. We've had some people who have come to us and they and they can use the uh, CGC uh, because there's a British format size plastic now. Right. You can you could you can have them encased. But for me, it's the tactile thing. It's 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 actually you know, having yeah, a you be able to read it. Picking it up, you know. Right. Yeah. Because there's two, there's like three levels. Like, do you want to read it only? If that's the case, probably digital is your best. But if you want to collect it, yeah, you put it in a case and grade it, which means you'll never read it. Mm -hmm. But then there's like the middle ground, which is like you yeah. want a hard copy that you can read. Um, and yeah, obviously, like it's it's hard to keep them in yeah. good condition that I mean, way. We know our market, Enzo. We know that this is we're producing in the niche field because right. comics. Let's be honest with you. In the UK, now I don't know about the general standing and the feeling. We've discussed very briefly about the European concept, a very sophisticated, you know, kind of <laughs> mature audience that have lovely bookshops. And but in the UK, it's changed. It's a niche field for people who are now lingering on in their collecting lives. Young yeah. people do read comics. Don't get me wrong. Young people do read comics, right? But it's the old grey heads like me who are spending the big bucks on the comics, and we love to have them in our hands. So yeah. we produce great comics that have got lovely production value and hopefully have got great strips in them that people bring people back. But we know the fact is that it's all about that 
that that that tactile and physical thing that people love right. about a, a product and and that's cool you know good, also, good quote uh, from uh, adam gray here comics are like boobs they look good on screen but they feel better in your hands by stan lee apparently yeah. stanley's funny the man the man himself uh said that um yeah i've always preferred to have a a, a physical comic i've only bought a couple um electronically i don't know what because it's like i like to read them in bed my little and, brother um, is a huge collector of comics and like you get to a place where you have so many boxes of comics you know you're like where do i put all this stuff you know yeah um i mean i do sometimes i i used to sell and swap them and stuff i've noticed this strip going back to sergeant shouty the first mm. few frames of this are a homage to that um advert you used to get in the the mar i think it was the marvel and the dc comics where there was a little strip of a skinny guy being bullied on the beach and then That's he right. went away and he got the and in the eye the special kit that made him all muscly and he came back and he beat up the bully and um yeah. but in this one sergeant shouty just turns up and throws the guy like two miles into the ocean and save the rat from awesome. happening then there's the and, 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 and lou lou is lou is the master of doing swatch swapping genres and <laughs> and working tight i mean look how many panels there are on that page it's the whole notion you know i don't think there's 12 panels on that but six yeah. and there's a whole bunch together there <laughs> and 13 panels you know so you get a lot of bang for your buck really and uh, it's all good fun and and we love some humor interspersed between our um Okay, so the last panel there, Doctor Doctor Plank is is monologuing. He's reading from the monologuing script book. You know, <laughs> yeah. Thousand and one villainous quotations. You sly dog. <laughs> Why are the cows getting milked? <laughs> That's hilarious. You also um, worked on this uh, comic called Lifeboat, and yeah. and now that's penned and written by, well, uh, drawn and, and written by. Uh, none other than Ian Gibson. Yeah, and Ian Gibson, for most people, would know through Alan Moore and Ian Gibson's Ballad of Halo, Halo, Halo Jones, uh, yeah. which yeah. is considered to be you know high art and and one of the best British Robo stories. Robo Hunter from 2000 AD. Yeah, yeah, um, um, and 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 had worked pretty much with 2000 AD from the inception. So early Dread very much lent on a lot of the work that Gibson produced his styling uh, the notion of how the cities were drawn and such like and Ian was very prolific he did a daily newspaper strip as well of dread the daily dread so he did hundreds of those uh that was a good gig I spoke to him about it he said you know he it earned him a lot more for a lot less time than he had right. to do with a comic designer he always did beautiful women no one did a be more beautiful woman so I've got here oh you're going to show as well yeah. that's it yeah. there we go there's a hardback I've got, I've got our new, well, we can't see that. I got, yeah. So Halo is not this character, but Ian Gibson tells us that this character, uh, Dee Dee, um, exists in pretty much the same universe. Um, and it's a, it's a complex story. I think you, you, on, on, before the show, Lance, you said pretty dense material, you know, a lot of going yeah. on, a lot of factions, a lot of, lot of things to start taking on the houses fighting each other, you know, but similar to it's, a, it's, it, it, it felt like a cross between, um, I've got it in my notes here. Um, complex political space opera about an illegitimate royal child who everyone wants dead. Uh, and there's a prophecy about a girl who'll bring order to the universe. So a little bit of June. Um, there's some characters in it that look like characters from Skiz, if you remember Skiz from 2008, yeah. which was the E.T. ripoff. Um, and, yeah, sort of pretext of going to war over controlling yeah. of mineral rights and... I mean, if you were to, when you scroll through, you get some of the pages of his artwork. What Ian was able to do with this, because it was his own um, publication, he, he he wasn't being paid by the page. It was his own work. Um, mm -hmm. It was incomplete at the time of his passing in December. We spent a year prior to that working with Ian, discussing, meeting him, and trying to make sure that what we had and what we could do with it and going forward with book two and book three, which is happening, um, would be to his blessing. Um, sure. and you really look at someone who were, when they did this page, it's a, I'm oh, sorry, this work, it was a, you're condensing a lot of years of work in this because it's what he turned to when he had a spare weekend, you know, right. when he had some downtime, this was his work. He was working on a way. So we allowed him the opportunity to introduce the book. He said, look, as it is, 
it's incomplete. So I want to come in and explain what's happening here, giving my opportunity to say what the strip was about. Um, we've got other professionals discussing in the book, forwards, afterwards, essays about his position in the industry, etc. But what we wanted to do was just let the comic work speak for itself. And it's the sort of thing when you allow yourself and you just open the book, you can just literally drift into a panel and you can spend time just looking at that panel and really enjoying yeah. it. Um, the color saturation is incredible. He was using gouache and, and Caron Dash pencil. Um, there's pretty much, it's all painted. It came on very large artwork um, boards. Wow. Um, it's very rich and it's just lovely. And as I said, it, it, it isn't dependent on an editor standing behind him saying, God damn it, we need those five pages next week. You know, it, 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 he returned to things over and over again and got something that he wanted to do right. Um, and yeah, so we were, it's been, it's been, people have been waiting for this book for 15 years on and off. He said he was starting it 15 years ago. People have been waiting it for that length of time. Um, so we're delighted to say that Diamond, um, US Diamond, Diamond UK um, will be, it's in the catalog in May. Um, so this will be in the States to buy at a reasonable price instead of paying that horrific shipping that we were talking about earlier, yeah. you know, $20, $30. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to be, yeah, we're going to hope it's going to, it's going to um, generate a lot of interest and support, in which case, you know, we're already working on book two with an artist who Ian had um, sanctioned and said, yep, they are the artist that I want to continue the strips. He was, he's done pretty much penciling of half of the next book, all the character developments done for it, the scripts there. So we're going to do the thing where if you continue scrolling, you'll get to the end of the book and you'll see what we've done is, um, a review, an analysis, an exploration of Ian's um, work. Uh, so there's just a few more pages of this to go. Mm. And oh, looking how he worked and how he built his stuff. <laughs> we will do that with the new artist and also show how the work has been developed from him. So it's a continuation because this is an exploration of an artist's styling and how they worked. And I think people appreciate it because he has a certain standing in British comics. As I say, only really known. He also did um, Mr. Miracle with um, right. Jeremy Proteus, okay, in the 80s. Also did Millennium, the DC Millennium crossover. Right. Stuff. So, you know, there is stuff that Americans will ha uh, definitely, our cousins will, will, will hack it onto. But we've gone into this. We've, we've allowed ourselves to sort of just really give people an opportunity to see how Ian worked because Ian never actually received uh, the type of book which would be that kind of art, the, the art of book which which is synonymous with certain people you know um there is there is um rumor that rebellion who own pretty much british comics and to yeah. in particular um will be um looking to do what they call the apex editions so i think brian bolland um mick mcmahon other sort of british notaries have got their apex these are oversized books but Ian Gibson, yeah, he should because he did an awful lot of work through different, through different, different. This, um, this guy characters. really reminds me of Spock. This this character, I don't know okay. if that's that's the inspiration, but he kind of or like Spock's dad, you know. Who was I know there. what you mean. Is that it's a look, isn't it? It's the eyes yeah. he gives you, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the that. haircut. And the haircut. You know, if a character looks like they're having a good time, you can see it. If they're feeling upset, you feel it. You know, he's so yeah. good at characterizations and making vulnerabilities and strengths apparent. And you know, his line work was incredible. I don't know if he ever really did any animation, um, but I studied and worked in the animation field for years, and it's got all the characteristics of how you give weight to things and how yeah. you emphasize certain kind of mo movement issues without putting all those stupid flash lines or whatever they are, you know, it's anyway. So yeah, this is a good book for us. Um, it's, it's a calling card for the States. Um, you know, we've spoken to, as I said, diamond, they're very keen on, on, on doing this, getting it out. And as I said, it's going to be in the May um, catalog. So I don't have a catalog number. They haven't issued us one yet, but um, cool. you know, it's going to be it's going to be around so ask for it if, if you're watching in the states you're interested you can get it from us but i'm saying unfortunately you're going to end up paying 20 dollars to have it shipped and i think it only costs 20 dollars to buy it so it does seem like a good um you know bow out for ian's legacy and um yeah absolutely i mean he 
deservedly yeah, so. Yeah, he is. He's he's one of those characters, the sort of studies where you go, you know, a man of such talent. It goes to show that you also need a bit of luck with your business um, head yeah. sometimes. In that, you know, he was not living a palatial lifestyle. Um, he was no. living in a lovely part of the world on the south coast in England. You know, idyllic setting. Um, but he wasn't like he was living in some, you know, incredible surroundings with marble, you know, <laughs> fixtures and fittings. And, you know, it was all very nice. Um, but he was just a very humble, normal guy, um, quite political. He had opinions, you know, he was never afraid to say what he felt about things. And we felt that very, we were evident to that when we, when we spoke with him and myself and Steve traveled and saw him on a handful of occasions. And he was delighted just to know that the book was happening because, Unfortunately, he was ill for most of last year um, and his health just, you know, he knew he knew, unfortunately, what the what the prognosis was going to be. Um, mm. and, and and I think people are happy that, yeah, there's a book that's out. That's the main thing. Um, so, yeah, you know, his always intention was ideally, oh, I'll return to it. Um, but he suffered some kind of tendonitis or ligament damage on his arm his drafting arm, like I think 10 or 15 years ago, which was just savage. You know, it's like a music guy going deaf or something, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. could be worse, a worse ailment. Um, so yeah, we give his process a lot of, a lot of space and, 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 you know, these are all his words and we interviewed him hours and hours and hours and let him discuss what he's doing. He wanted people to know his process because he was purely and never went digital. He was, he was analog, you know, painting yeah. Yeah. And, and, and such like. Old so, school. Old school, old school, yeah. and 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 it is an art which is. How much longer is it going to be around? I mean, I don't know. You know, we pride well, ourselves. Oh yeah, with AI, you know, you know oh, it's, uh... yeah. Well, we have a policy. You know, we got a policy, and we'll stick it there. No, never knowingly going to use AI. Doesn't mean right. we're not going to use, you know, computer programming in terms of graphics. That's a completely different thing. You're not scraping a whole bunch of people's IP, are you? And stealing stuff. The oh, yeah. um yeah I got also, pretty early on thinking I have a stance here and I have a position and I feel in my gut that we need to do something and say something so we did early on and and it's with our submissions so sorry to come back to submissions please if you use AI in that sense that you you're fired work, you're <laughs> gonna, well you're never going to get <laughs> you are never going to get the gig put it that way um yeah I mean the thing about physical media physical paper drawing on paper it's like um. Yeah, definitely like drawing digitally is like it saves time. There's a lot of like uh, shortcuts you could do. And yeah, yeah also yeah. sending art to be, um, you know, examined is easy. You yeah. just email it. You know, previously you got to scan stuff or or in the old days you had to mail it, you know, like the 80s and stuff. Yeah. You'd have to like take copies and mail them and or mail originals like God forbid something happens to them. Well, isn't, oh, the, isn't the industry littered with those stories of gray-haired editors saying, my God, they lost their work in the back of a taxi or on the subway? Well, better or yet, <laughs> you would, uh, what was Marvel with DC? Like, you would, these artists would mail the originals, and then it get used for the books, and then they would keep the originals and usually destroy them. And it's like, I think they made a rule eventually, like, you got to mail it back to the artist so that way they can, you know, sell the original artwork. You know, that's where, like, a bulk of these artists that work for you know uh, big companies would uh, get their money you know but uh yeah. but uh the thing about digital stuff it's like yeah it's such a time save and and it's like you know the, like you said it's like i wouldn't be surprised if eventually um also the cost of material the cost of everything's going up paper and pen and ink and all the stuff the art supplies i'm not as i say i'm not i'm not saying that i won't support artists using drawing programs that's no oh, no of course sure, but, sure. i'm, I'm no, saying like it's gonna be weird yeah, when we eventually AI. get to a point where like you know physical uh uh you know artists who draw like you know old school style are gonna be so rare you know here's yeah. the thing though it's it's worth bearing in mind i'm just saying this so we're in we're in a part of the business in our in our model where we still kickstart yeah and mm -hmm. high value rewards what can they be i tell you what you've got a good artist we had ian's artwork from this book yeah, he took a good cut from all this artwork that we handled. Literally, we took a percentage, he took a much bigger percentage, and he's fine. He did really well out of this, and he should. It's his artwork. But any aspiring artist who's looking to get involved in kickstarting, if you can pass on your pages and you can provide them as a reward, there are people out there who will punt for it. Oh, they will right. say, sure, $50, $100, $200, mm. whatever mm. they feel that they think they, they, they appreciate your work enough. And if you're Bill Sinkovitz, it'll be 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. And it's yeah. fine. But 
if you're digital, the only thing you can do, and it's not a problem, and I'm not saying it's the only, but one of the options you're really left with is printing off and signing prints. And, yeah. and maybe that's an easy way to go as well. But people do like something physical. They do like a, a, yeah. an artifact. That's the point, yeah? Well, yeah. talking of um, something physical, you rather generously offered uh, to give something away this evening. So those people that are in the chat now, uh, listen up, because it's your chance to grab a freebie. Uh, do you want to yeah. explain that to us quickly? Okay. Physical in the sense that <laughs> it's surprised. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not physical in the sense that you won't hold it, but everyone, and I'm not sure. So I was thinking, um, because this is, goes onto YouTube and I could check the comments. So maybe if you scrape the comments next week, uh, Lance, and there's people yeah. who leave a comment on the YouTube, that's yeah. fine by me. You can get me that information. Yeah. We don't want you putting your, perhaps your email information on a, on a, no, on, no. a on a public site. So email us and our email is not that tricky. So, Okay. You've got the 77 above me, right? Those numbers. So when I yeah. say the 77, it's yeah. T-H-E, as you see on the on the, on the the graphic. Mm -hmm. The 77 comic at gmail.com. Just it. email us. Just email us and put in the title of the show. So the Outcast Creative, yeah? As the yeah. subject line. And we will send you um, a, a the digital comic. version of issue one, which is a reprint with Ian ian gibson's work in so this is a reprint fifth reprint of our first comic i was always pleased to know when i remembered i bought teenage mutant ninja turtles i've got a number oh, one yeah whoa they so, reprinted 42 times right i'm thinking one day this might reprint because we don't do huge reprints but this is our fifth reprint and we re-edited it now you get a digital of this but we will also i think i will select a couple of people from those comments and i don't care where you live I don't care where you live. I will send a couple of people the physicals and a couple of other bits and bobs from our back catalogue. Okay. So everyone will get a digital. Just send us your email. The 77 comic at gmail.com. We will select from a hat. We'll post it onto our Facebook group as well. If you're interested in hitting us on Facebook, just put in the 77. Okay. If you're on X, formerly Twitter, just put in... Um, I think it's the 77 limited, okay, or 77 comic. Anything with the 77 and you'll find us on Instagram. Yeah, all that, you'll find all us. your information is already down below the stream. So fantastic. Yeah, I've got a tattoo on my chest. I'll show it to you. It's got our email address on. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so we're very, we, we love the fact that the present Kickstarter we're doing is like jump on in so far as it's a jump on issue that we're doing deals for people who can get like a bundle of all of our previous stuff that's super cheap, not even half price. It's less than that, much less than that. Digitals is like a third of the price. Um, but we also do free comic book day. So cool. if you want to come on to our site on Facebook um, on May the, it's not May the 4th because that's obviously April. a different day. Is it April? So it's actually in a couple of weeks' time, isn't it? Comic no, book maybe day, it right? is May. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not prepared to say exactly when that is. Let's look it up. Look it up. Come to us. You'll see the same deal. We'll send you something else digital. It is May know? 4th, Saturday, May 4th. What? Is comic book free comic book day? Free comic book day, yes. On that day as well. Okay, so we don't do that. We don't do Lucasfilms or, 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 or Disney-type products, but, uh, you know. Other comics are available, and um, so yeah, we're just happy for people to check us out. We know that we're we're pretty niche. We know that not a lot of people were bought our stuff, um, but we think it stands up, and we want people to have free access to it. So the digital stuff, literally, we'll send you free comics. It's not a problem at all. Sweet, fantastic. So just put the Outcast Creative. You can put competition if you want in the header of your email. Send them uh, an email to the seventy seven comic at gmail.com uh, and you'll get sent a free digital copy of lifeboat um issue one i'm guessing um yeah it's issue one the reprint but there are nine others to enjoy should you like it and a couple of you will get sent a few physical things in the in the, in, the, in the Absolutely. so uh do 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 that so everybody in the chat pay attention uh write down that that email well, i've got uh a well, couple of other things we're going to plug i'll save the I'll give the Lawless Comic Con a plug just before we wrap up. But I also want to bend your uh, your your comic knowledge um, on something I've been always been trying to track down. 
Uh, and it, I just thought about this as we've been doing this stream. So um, I would say around 1983, 84, um, there was there was a bit of a buzz around people using airbrushed artwork. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It was suddenly a thing. And somebody produced a very, I don't know if you remember, you used to get those those big hardback books that would come out. And it uh, and it would be all the covers of various science fiction novels, the artwork, mm. big spaceships, huge big spaceships coming over planets and cities hovering over planets and this kind of thing. Um, and um, they were just sort of compilations with no story. But somebody brought out um, something I'd never seen before, which was like this this airbrushed artwork. It was very heavy metal in terms of style. So it was. Um, I think it was a female heroine with a you know tight fitting costume, very well endowed in the mammary department, lots of very phallic weapons and things, taking on aliens. And it was this limited edition book, but the artwork in it was incredible. It was very well done. And I, I just remember a couple of people had it at school. Um, and I thought, oh, I must get hold of a copy of that one day and you know, later in life, I'll find a copy of it somewhere. Never seen it since. Um, does that ring any bells with you? Well, I said I was a fan. I was a huge fan of Foss and the other artists. They did stuff for Alien and, you know, they were doing big spray artwork and they did a right. lot of the science fiction covers for books and things in the 80s. Mm. You know, our Facebook group is full of people who are much nerdier than I am. I know somebody, I don't like somebody will know. There's probably someone who will watch this or listening if I asked. I can get back to you, Lance, and I can answer that. And then you can tell your viewers next time what it was. Uh -huh. um, but that was right up my street. I was always very much, I'm, 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 I'm visually led, you know, um, you know, I could watch a science fiction film for the fact that I know it's going to have some great uh, costume design, you know, background mm. art. I look now at the, I look now at the older films and I just pause them and look for the matte paintings. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. love yeah, yeah. that sort yeah. of work. Um, because I re did you did anyone here or did you know anyone who went for the heritage because they held those map paint they had the map painting sales didn't they for um, the big sale they've had recently with all of the Lucasfilm and the uh, the Star Wars stuff and the, they had map paintings from loads of stuff as well as the costumes and the map paintings went for virtually nothing what? you know whereas wow. a costume whereas a costume is you know I don't know Deckard's leather jacket is going to be two hundred thousand you know what I mean something like that right. The matte paintings went for two, three thousand bucks. It's right. just crazy. Well, that's not virtually nothing for me, but yeah, no, I know it's right. nothing. But if you want some memorabilia, it's it's yeah. bordering on you know you only have to sell half a kidney, don't you? You don't have to you know <laughs> sell your children's kidneys as well. So uh, I'm just saying, I just think there's some undervalued work in this in this whole in this whole one. Comics in general, I think, are I've always said are undervalued because like it's just funny because like it's a kind of a underappreciated, it's one of the least appreciated forms of artwork in terms of, uh, you know, normies, but like, it's the, one of the hardest things to do as an artist. Cause you have to learn how to draw everything in, in perspective, like yeah. sequential storytelling. I'd argue comic books are harder than animation, even though it requires less drawing, uh, sequential storing is uh, storytelling is very, you know, it's difficult to, to master, you know. Absolutely. But I do what I do like about it as well. The, 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 the kind of converse of that is that as an entry level, anyone can produce a comic. I get True. that. You I want to do a comic. Uh, I, just, I was I was hoping to get one uh, growing this October, but my YouTube channel is just growing too slow. So just put it are you are, are, will you consider yourself then as a writer for the comic is that what you want to yeah do? yeah well yeah exactly i'm a graphic designer by trade i do a bunch of band posters for 20 years you know and awesome. i've been drawn since i was a little kid and it's just one of those things where it's like oh this would be you know a cool story and it's like rather than uh get into uh you know hollywood or uh you know whatever i feel like comic books would be like kind of more up my alley but that's the big problem also nowadays is most people or a lot of people anyway nowadays um, especially when you're talking about Marvel and DC, like a lot of these new writers, uh, not necessarily the artists, but especially like the, a lot of the new writers are basically just like these comics are basically just like glorified Netflix pitches, which is like a common criticism for a lot of these comics. They're not really trying to do comics. They just want to use comics as a gateway to get into Hollywood. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. ah, yeah, yeah. yeah they ah. kind of maybe see themselves as, 
or not understanding fully the work goes behind, for example, storyboarding. Right. They think a comic book can storyboard a film for, for, for me to then oh, right. pass on to a, you know, an agent or somebody who's going to yeah. open a door somewhere. We work with people who are professional um, storyboard artists and they also do comics, but the two things are not the same whatsoever. No. The work no. is vastly different. And, no. you know, but I'll be honest with you, storyboarding pays them. Oh yeah. In fact, that's what, that's something I would love to uh, get into is storyboarding. Cause like, and also it's funny cause like some, you know, depending on the director, like some directors want very uh, detailed, highly uh, graphic, uh, well yeah, illustrated. Well. Yeah. Some, some directors don't even like storyboards. Sometimes they just do little stick figure storyboards. I mean, you know, mm. so, you know, you never, you never know. Yeah. I think you've yeah, worked we with got um... a guy who does stuff for us who did the um, game of Thrones as well. Wow. Um, and, and, and such like, and a lot of costume design for that as well. Um, and can you, it's can interesting. You work with, um, Andy Collins, was it Andy Collins, the storyboard guy? Mike Collins. Is it Mike, Mike Collins? Mike Collins. Yeah, he yeah. does, he does um, BBC Doctor Who productions as well. Awesome. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, Cause he's been around for quite a while doing 40 odd years. He started off yeah. in Marvel. Yeah. Marvel yeah. And uh, I guess another, uh, pivot, you know, would be like uh, concept designers, you know, character designers, these type of, uh, especially in like video games and uh, other stuff like yeah. these guys or science fiction movies, like the ability, especially nowadays with digital, um, like digital painting. I, I do a lot of Photoshop, like just drawing in Photoshop. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, like I've seen some of these artists like Bobby Chu and some of the other guys, mm. uh, you know, he did like concept art for a lot of the Tim Burton movies, like Alice in Wonderland or whatever, but like they get paid a lot of money. Cause it's like, Hey, we need this crazy, fantastical, you know, alien. And they'll send you something in like an hour. And it'll yeah. be like fully rendered paint stuff. But again, yeah. it's like pivoting from that to comic books is like not going to be. But, you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing these things. I mean, we've got guys who work one way. For example, they'll render a three dimensional figure. And from that, they can rotate and animate and do all right. sorts of things, put it within a, a background and a foreground and then produce a comic book from it. There are other people that purely do two dimensional approach to it True. and have to build the graph. But. I don't know. It depends. And it's so, you know, we've got people who do very cartoony work. We've got people who do very polished um, computer graphics. We've got people, as I said, do large oil paintings. That's why I like so, anthologies is like not just the change in tone of the story, but change in like, you know, the artwork styles. Mm. It's always good. I think the secret would um, be, and I'm not, I'm not discussing, I'm not saying what you should do. I'm just saying to oh, anyone right. watching no. is that you should do what, your where you feel your strengths lie and, and and really work on building your strengths up you know oh for sure so i mean this artwork don lawrence so don lawrence interesting enough Gibson, if, you, if you remembered this comic. don lawrence's studio in the 90s um when don lawrence was still alive and don lawrence is considered to be one of the masters um we use uh, a guy called pete weston his dad mike weston was a master of british art as well nice. considered to be black and white work but this stuff the notion of having Roman Empire with space, you know, what, what, what doesn't, what, you know, it, it, it really should be. I can't, yeah, you know, it really, I'm pitching it right now. You guys, let's put this as a pitch together. Let's go to Hollywood. Let's pitch the Trigon yeah. Empire because, you know, it's Roman and Star Wars. What's not going to work? You know, it's going to be brilliant. So, yeah, the Trigon Empire was, um, uh, was, was something I always remembered. I, and I got bought the big, um, th they did a compendium book of the whole thing. And I, I got bought that by my parents and a prefect confiscated it off me when I took it to school and I never got it back. Yeah. Uh, I was so annoyed, but that was actually, that was the first comic I ever read even before 2000 AD, which is why yeah. I wondered if you, if you I remembered it. it. I was, I couldn't afford to buy more than one comic. I bought 2000 AD even then with a few pence, it cost, it didn't leave me much else. I had friends and we shared our comics and I had someone who bought the periodical that this sort of publication, this came out. I think out it was in Eagle. Trigon Empire yeah. was an Eagle, wasn't it? And Eagle was, as they say, saw away success because at that time, just after the war, during the fifties, when we still had austerity, when we still had rationing in, in, in this part of the world, to have something that you open the pages, it must have been for our forebodies, you know, our parents and such like, to open something which was colourful and alive, yeah. forward looking, not 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 all kind of, you know, we weren't and 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 not war based. It was um yeah, must have been absolutely you know, and for me, science fiction was something which I I still I still hope, you know, I will definitely see someone land on the moon, you know, of course. And I was there in 69, but only two years old. But I'm I'm hoping that I will see someone land on Mars. I'm hoping that we will have some ship go out and do something. That, as, a kid, as a kid, the future yeah. is going to be 
amazing and that's that's what i hope to see in my lifetime is the is the the mission to mars you know the landing on mars um well Successful before we be landing on mars that's important <laughs> before we, yeah before we begin to um wrap up yeah preferably not putin um but anyway let's not let's not do politics before we no, wrap up perfectly people, you can, people, can, people can meet you in person if they go to the lawless comic-con which is uh coming up in bristol yeah, end of may five. end of may so it's its 10th um edition and wow. uh, this is the 77 guest list there's my name one of them and uh that's uh, steve and dave and joe Andy Richmond's there. The other artists, so Andrew Sawyers, Aid Hughes, Ian Stockforth, Mike Walters, all artists of ours. And Steve McManus is the guy from 2000 AD who runs Blazer. Yeah. We've, the, the, if you were to show the guest list for the official guest list, which is just ours, but if you've got that, you've got people who are just like, from the British perspective, are just like the gods. So John Wagner, Brian Bolland, Glenn Fabry, um, John Higgins, Watchman, um, and such like. It's going to be an amazing thing. So we sponsor this as well. So our little logo's on it. We'll be doing a gala evening. We're going to have an award ceremony. Tickets are still available. Uh, go to lawless.com and check it out. We also do the other conventions. So we do um, Thought Bubble, which is the largest um, comic-only convention. It's not one of those ones with appearances and, and Lego and stuff. So here we go, lawless.com. Um, Keep scrolling. Let everyone see this. But we, so oh, we, do, we, we do the full we do the full circuit now. There's, there's John Wagner, creative Judge Dredd. Brian yeah. Holland, yeah, with one of our comics. There we go, Steve. Oh, there's Steve. There he is. Yeah, that's right. Steve Austin there. Yeah, um, a whole load of famous people being famous, and and you know, and here we go, some judges on patrol and such like, and and it's great. So it's it's about as I think Sue, the the the, the organizer says, she says you come for the comics, but you come back for the tribe. In that you identify very strongly with the kind of people who go there, and it's social. It's in a nice hotel. The bar's not too expensive. There's great breakout areas. You know, it's not vast. We have, I think, guests are three. I mean, sorry to say, sorry, ticket buys, 300. Guests, 30. So there's one guest for every 30, for every 10 people. So right. you know, there aren't huge queues. You're not being shown no. VIP lanes. It's not restricted, yeah. you know. In I was going to say it's, it's more, per more personable than going to one of the big comic cons and you know you're 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 mingling a bit more with people on the floor and stuff as opposed to just doing panels and that kind of thing yeah you know you're absolutely right there yeah. and um we do the larger ones as well we go to london do the london film cons and stuff and i hope one day to come over to new york and potentially i suppose do the big one in the west coast you know san diego but um nix is wondering if you're ever going to do any eastern european comic cons in romania well we have people who associated with us um milan kovic is in the czech republic so i don't know where you are nix um He's romania Transylvanian. Yeah. okay transylvania good point nix get in touch with me at the 77 comic um gmail.com because i would love to know about the scene in romania um and i'm free to travel um i can bring a one-man show over i can travel light and do shows i go to ireland i travel around i do nice. i do as many cons as i want to i'm very fortunate in the stage of my career if there's something happening in romania nicks you can be my guest oh, sorry i'll be your guest okay nicks was also asking earlier um if uh you had any plans to uh do any animation since you had an animation background yeah, so we do. We we have some animations that we use um, for some of our adverts. Trailers, like, yeah. There is one for like. There is one for Lifeboat. We've got a whole new series of them coming as well. Uh, and it has, yeah, that's a great question, Nix. And it's something that I need to be working um, kind of conjunctively with someone else. I, I'm a I'm a publisher. I also have to do the fulfillments of the. I'm still like a post. A post room boy to be honest oh, with you boy. Um, Fulfillment we do have like, people uh, who do that for us and i've got i've got all sorts of nifty machines called franking machines that do enveloping and all sorts for yeah. me but i'm still the guy who's got to take them to the front of the house and the postal guy comes and collects them i've got a wheel them out in a trolley and stuff um i still got to set up the kickstarters so what i'm saying is that i'm always looking for talented people to come on board get involved and say i've got these skills you know and we work and increase the brand knowledge so it's not a done deal insofar as saying, oh, we've all got it in-house. We're always looking to meet and talk with interesting people. Um, and it's happening. But we've, oh, we're still a young company. We're still just four years old. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm in it, we're all in it for the long game, really. So, 
you know, the, uh, we, we, we feel like we feel like we're, we're, we're taking it bit by bit. Sure, we'd love to do an animated film, you know, okay, but we'll Nick. start with it. We'll start with the one minute segments first. You know, yeah. What, what are the plans for the future in terms of the, the comics you're already producing? Yeah. They're, they're, they're quarterly, aren't they? Like four of them per year? Is sure, that... absolutely. So we produced, yeah, yeah. 13, we produced 13 books last year. No. Uh, so not every one of them is getting a monthly. You can tell that. Yeah, yeah sure. Some sure. of them are coming out more regularly. But what we are doing is people will be able to buy our reprint and bundled yeah. products now. So we are going to have a series run where in the States and across the, Europe and the United Kingdom, the 77 will probably come out bi-monthly, every two months. And we've got enough now for three years worth to go out. Yeah. Nice. So because we've got the material now and it's organic, we can, can we can we can now repackage and do that. Um, we're taking on new titles. I said so Lifeboat book two is coming out. We've got a new Penny Pentagram book coming out. We've got some submissions that we're looking into, some European style work that we've produced elsewhere. And people are starting to bring us material saying, would you publish for us now? What's the deal? What are we, you know, what are we buying into here? What what, what's the business model so i'm very much um if people want to submit you know books which have maybe not seen the light of day um get in touch 77 comic gmail.com um you know you can have you can have as much time as you want with me i do video chats all the time with people and yeah i think it's just like i, I remember when i used to, you know talk with people who worked in music and film production you got to kiss an awful lot of frogs you really do have to, <laughs> you have to grease a lot of palms or just rub well we're gonna to um to well, sometime later this year, I don't know the date yet, but one of the people that I'm doing it with was in the chat earlier. We're going to do a, with a panel of people, we're going to do our top five uh, favorite Judge Dredd stories. Um, so if you'd like to be one of the guests on that with your own list, uh, that'd be ace if you wow. want to come back. Cool. And uh, yeah, I know it's quite hard to pick just five, isn't it? But uh, I know the Apocalypse War is definitely going to be one of mine. Um so well, look. I think we'll 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 wrap it up there. Uh, and it's been fantastic having you on. Um, uh, uh, it's given me a really interesting insight into kind of how this independent comic scene has evolved and how it's how it's working. Um, and I think you know it's quite inspiring and and will be inspiring, especially for any uh, uh, budding people who've always wanted to do a strip, including Stepenzo here. So. Um, firing up their creative juices i hope uh so you can find all of ben's information it's already uh below do go and check out the kickstarter as well check out the 77 website where you can see all the different uh comics that are on offer was there anything else you wanted to say ben before we uh, wrap it up there i want to thank you guys so much first of all um it's been a wonderful um hour and a half chatting with you guys um i just want to kind of like i just want to say to someone who's thinking about it you know it's it just takes you to decide what it is that it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to write? Are you trying to draw? Are you trying to publish? Are you trying to whatever? And and just have a go and let your friends see it. And you can get funding. It's, you know, you can go to Kickstarter. It's it's not difficult. None of these things cost anything. It just requires your your time. If you want to work with people, get, you know, find that gang, find those people. Um, it doesn't have to be a solo operation. Um, Nick's I'm had one other question. Like, sorry, sorry, yeah. No, I'll say Nick's had one other question for you about um, uh, if you had any movie uh, that you keep going back to to cleanse a, a hard day or recharge your batteries, anything you like to watch to chill out to? I well, kind of asked time, that, I asked that question at the beginning, so well, that was, that was yeah, it wasn't quite the same one. And uh, the oh, one no. that lifts my spirits, okay, this is going to be super slushy, you're going to no. go really pretty in pink i really like that film yeah, it's a good I, one. I, own, I own the dvd and i have the soundtrack on vinyl so yeah um I, i'm a big big john hughes fan hey, john hughes yeah. you know yeah absolutely I, was, uh, I did a did a stream with somebody else um uh where we were talking about movies from the 80s and of course we went through yeah. a whole Whole load they're of those. wholesome, but they also take the mick a little bit, you know. No, they're, they're, you know the American psyche just enough to kind of like, you know. But it's it's. I loved it. I learned more about the states watching those films than than a lot of other things. You know? Yes, indeed. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. Listen, thanks, Ben, so much for coming on. Uh, for those people watching, we're actually going to be live again at twenty past ten because we're reviewing episode five of Shogun, and that's slightly later because of our interview with Ben. 
today. So uh, 20 past 10, we will be back uh, reviewing Shogun. Might be a long stream, only probably about 45 minutes, maybe an hour tops uh, reviewing Shogun. Then we're back again on, is it Tuesday with the Nielsen ratings? I don't think we've got any uh, uh, Chew the Fats uh, this weekend. Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. So uh, back on uh, with our regular show every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, but uh, two two or three Sundays uh, uh, a month, uh, we'll normally be doing a detailed review of some TV show. Rather, we have just finished Masters of the Air, possibly the biggest disappointment of all time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't know if, if I go that far, but it certainly didn't live up to expectations. But, uh, well, I'll, I'll be doing a longer review of that in the near future. Anyway, Thanks very much for everybody uh, in, in the chat, uh, uh, particularly Nick, who asked uh, so many questions. Thanks to Ben for coming on. And, of course, my co-host, Depenzo. I'll be rushing off straight away, but I'll be back again uh, at 20 past 10. Uh, don't forget, all the information for Ben's comics and everything are all in the stuff below. Uh, but until then, we'll see you all again real soon. Mm -hmm.